Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second edition of the Jewish Art Salon Open Studios online programs. We will be presenting one hour programs with two to four artists, once or twice a month into spring 2021. The featured artists in upcoming programs are members of the Jewish Art Salon who responded to a call or were invited. For now, I would like to first thank the Jewish Art Salon for the stage to give us this opportunity to curate, co-curate with Judy Joseph. Uh, really enjoy the process. Uh, I want to really thank the, the great team that we have. First of all, advisor, the founder and president of the Jewish Art Salon, Yona Verwer, uh, Hannah Weisenthal Elias, and Chesley Nometo that are working with us on this program. And it's wonderful, wonderful job. The next program will be next month, Tuesday, November 17 at noon Eastern time. Artist presenters will be Julianne Bolach and Sayona Benjamin. Looking forward to that. Today, we will present three artists, Joel Silverstein, Leah Rabb, and Philip Schwartz. Each artist will present the work uninterrupted and a five minute question period will follow. Please type your questions into the chat and we will call on you to ask. Time is limited, so please be sure you are asking a question. Okay, our first artist today is Joel Silverstein. He has shown nationally and internationally at JADA, Art Basel, Miami, the Van Leer Institute, the Mishkan La Omanut Museum, Israel, Durfner Museum of Judaica, New York City, the Amstel Kirk Gallery in Holland, the Rabbi Aryeh S. and Tess Hyams Judaica Museum in Roslyn Heights, New York, and the Jerusalem Biennial 2015 and 2017. The artist critic is a founding and executive member of the Jewish Art Salon and has curated or advised on 14 salon exhibitions, including Through Compassionate Eyes, Artists Call for Animal Rights at the Charter Oak Center, Hartford, Connecticut, POW for Jewish Comic Con, the Dura Europos Project, both at the Philadelphia Museum of Jewish Art and UJA New York. He's presented at CAJM, the Council of Jewish Museums, the Connie Conference of Jewish Art at the 92nd Street Y, and the Association for Jewish Studies Annual Conference in 2019. His work and curated exhibitions are cited in Ori Z. Soltz, Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennium, Millenniums of Jewish Art and Architecture, and Matthew Bagel's Jewish Identity in American Art, A Golden Age Since the 1970s. And Joel, um, I'm gonna allow you now to share your screen. So I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you uh, to Judith and Dorit. Uh, this has been an incredibly um, curated uh, series of talks. And I wanna thank my co-artists uh, who are speaking today, um, Leah and Philip, because they're wonderful people. I know them for a bunch of years already and really wonderful artists. And they're kind of in the same realm of figure and narration. So it's really wonderful uh, talking to them. And I realize I have 12 minutes, so we're going to go with this. Um, I wanted to bring this up because um, I did a series, first of all, in COVID, this was a, a series specific to COVID. Um, at the same time COVID was going on, I had neck surgery, which was pretty severe. So usually uh, people who know my work, I uh, work in large kind of history paintings or even small history paintings with multiple figures and big compositions. I couldn't do that for the last year. And uh, with COVID, everything was shut down. So I was in my house. So I wanted to do a series uh, based on the class that we took. Uh, the salon sponsored a, 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 um, a class on Pardes. And um, I wanted to thank uh, first Richard for organizing that and Rabbi Bellino. This was at the Sixth Street Synagogue. It was open to salon members. There were about 40 people that came pretty much every week. Uh, with COVID that was shut down too and was finished online. Um, and again, this is a, it's a difficult um, a topic to talk about in 10 minutes, but I'm gonna try. Um, so anyway, uh, we studied uh, the idea of Pardes, and Pardes is a sacred garden or grove, and it has great meaning in Judaism, so this is, thank you. Wait, okay. So um, we learned in the class from Rabbi Bellino, uh, for those people that want to check it out later, also the whole class is online, you can look at it. Um, so Pardes is a great subject, and it starts out with an allegorical story. So there were four men who were rabbis, 
Um, and they're all great rabbis in one way or another. So it's Ben Azai, Ben Zomer, Acher, who's called the other, and Rabbi Akiva, who's very famous to the rabbis, okay? First rabbi looks in the grove and he dies right away, boom. Second rabbi, Ben Zomer, goes crazy, he goes mad. The third rabbi called Acher, he destroyed the plants, which they're not sure what that means exactly. It could mean that he went rogue. There's a lot of stories of him becoming a, 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 a Roman sycophant or a Greco-Roman philosopher, or he destroyed young uh, Jewish minds by planting ideas in their head that study was not good. Okay, and the last one, Rabbi Akiva, who's the most famous, entered, went in peace and entered in peace. Okay, so the early interpretations of the story were mystical, and uh, it starts out in the sixth century. There's a whole thing of a mystical chariot or makaba mysticism, and it's about the kind of mystical experience. Um, later versions um, um, talk about uh, the encounter with God as the four modes of interpretation in Judaism. So it's an interesting mix uh, for people who are really um, Talmudically learned and study, you know, there's four levels of interpretation. So it goes from concrete to the second level to allegorical and then to parallel or anagogic and then to mystical is the last one, okay? Um, I found that really fascinating. And again, it's a lot of material, but what I found was fascinating that in Judaism, there's this mixture of the really logical and the really mystical. And what I did was I set up a series of, I didn't want to do it as a series of landscapes. So I decided to do it in terms of the human face. And I tried to structure the paintings as um, uh, a grid of portraits. So they're all uh, portraits. Some of them are personal of my family. Some of them are imagined and some of them are taken from history. So I'm going to go, and it goes uh, chronologically in history as well. Okay. Um, how do I go to the, oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, there are more uh, uh, portraits than this. I'm going to show about 20 today, but I'm in the 30s. It's probably going to go up to 50. So, and I'll try to run through these. Try no, again, it's hard for you to imagine this, but each portrait is part of a bigger hole that doesn't exist yet, and it's going to be on a wall in a space that doesn't exist yet. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the individuals' uh, uh, portraits and see where they go. The idea is also there are certain themes in my work. Um, using uh, a kind of um, post-impressionist observation, like, uh, like a painter uh, who paints regular portraits, but they go from people who I know to uh, people who nobody can ever know. And that's the idea. Okay, so this is a memory portrait of myself at 22, and I'm in a synagogue setting. Okay, so that's the first thing. The synagogue is actually uh, Stanton Street Synagogue on the Lower East Side. Okay, okay. This was, uh, this was used for the advertisement. Um, uh, in the Second Temple period, there was an idea of Sophia or wisdom. Uh, in the Christian religion, it's Logos. Uh, and for Jews, it's linked to the Shekhinah. So this is actually, it's a um, high school portrait of my mom, actually, who's uh, been gone for many years. And I, I painted her in terms of, uh, there's a kind of mythological motif of uh, Jew, he Hebrews being in Egypt and individuating. So it's, uh, multiple gods into a singular god, uh, themes of uh, masculinity and femininity in Judaism, and logic and mysticism. Uh, these were all done in 2020, except for one of them. Okay, this is a portrait of my dad as the patriarch Jacob. Uh, that's my wife behind him actually holding up a beach towel. Um, I wanted to leave the uh, kind of vestiges of stagecraft or phoniness in the portrait. And again, my father's been gone for many years, but I, I did him as a patriarch. Okay, next. Okay, uh, this is an imaginary portrait of Elisha ben Abuya, who is called Acher, and he's the rabbi that went rogue. So in Judaism, there's also, for Western Jews, uh, there's a big issue with the relationship of secular philosophy, which is Greco-Roman, and Jewish philosophy, and how Judaism at times embraced Greco-Roman philosophy and culture, okay? Um, so I, I uh, painted him as a kind of 19th century yeshiva bucha. In back of him is a Greco-Roman uh, temple altar, and that's from uh, uh, Pompeii, okay? Uh, there's also six um, palaces in this mystical experience of Pardes that the rabbis write about. They mean a lot of different things. I took them in a very personal way. So this is the first palace. Uh, this is Brighton Beach where I grew up. You can see, sorry, you can, can you see the arrow? There's the parachute jump in the background. Uh, there's some swimmers, and the first uh, level is shame. So it's like different levels. This is kind of like in the throes of the divine experience, you go through all these kind of like uh, transformations. OK. 
okay? Uh, this portrait of my wife, it's just a straight portrait. And again, it goes from like the kind of my personal circle to out there. Uh, this is a portrait of my son, Jake, as the Jewish paradigmatic artist, Bitzalel. If you look in the background, there are Egyptian uh, 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 giant statues and he's wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt, okay? Uh, this is the young Miriam from the Bible. It's a memory portrait. Um, and I represent Miriam twice. There's a couple of times I use either matriarchs or female prophets or female personifications. Again, uh, I kind of feel that the feminine aspect of Judaism is very important and very strong. It's only recently that people have been talking about that. But I guess growing up as a Jewish kid, those things were always important to me. So, and Miriam is an important character. I'll show you in a later portrait of her. Okay. This is the second palace, uh, self-loathing. It's from a photograph from the Outer Limits. And it's a black and white photo that I interpreted in full color in an expressionistic style. This is Miriam at the well. Uh, for those of you that participated in the 2017 Biennial in Israel, the issue of water is very important. And water in the rabbinic tradition means Torah or learning. So the symbol of Miriam at the well is kind of like this image of, of knowledge. And I thought it was interested. Uh, you could tell kind of my influences. I, I, I like 19th century painting, but this reminds me of a kind of Lorenzo Lotto kind of uh, Northern Italian kind of portrait. Okay. This is the philosopher uh, Philo. He lived in Alexandria and he also, he was the first Jew to use Greek philosophy. And he's, he's kind of indirectly important to the rabbis, but very important to Christianity. He was also involved with the Septuagint, which translated the Bible for non-Jews, for Greeks, and uh, later for Christians. Uh, this is a, uh, a paper mosaic and acrylic. So this part is uh, kind of quasi in an ancient style, kind of in a Pompeii or in a Fayum kind of style. Uh, so it's uh, the mosaic pieces are actual mosaic. This is the third palace of illusions called Folly. The monkey is the usual in Western painting, a kind of symbol for, for you know, folly or kind of sexuality, different things, okay? Go on from here. Uh, this is a portrait of Maimonides. It was done from an engraving, but again, I interpreted it as if you were in front of me. And Maimonides wrote the book Guide for the Perplexed. And that's also a kind of uh, um, trying to figure out if you have faith in the modern world, this is written in 1100, it's like amazing. And it's a huge book. Um, if you believe in God, and there's all this logical evidence that there is no God, or you shouldn't believe in God, well, how do you reconcile those two things? So in that book, that's what he tries to do. And it's still a very important, it's a very important book to Western philosophy. And I wanted to kind of show him in his living room, you know, in his library. Okay, this is the fourth palace is the Yetzirah, which is the evil impulse. Uh, those of you who are movie buffs, it's uh, uh, Frederick March and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is obviously Mr. Hyde. For modern people, Mr. Hyde is the impulse, the in impulse, and it's the evil part of us. And for the rabbis, it's very interesting because the evil impulse is not something to be killed. It's something to be kind of let out and understood and controlled. There are these great stories of, um, it's like a, a lion standing in for the evil impulse and the rabbis say, blind the lion and keep him around. So in other words, it's that notion that you can't be heroic without, there was a Star Trek episode like that too, where Captain Kirk gets split into two people and he realizes he can't make a freaking decision because his evil impulse had all the mojo, you know what I mean? So I think that was a very, and that was written by Richard Matheson who was Jewish by the way. So it's, uh, I think it's very clear that uh, um, Jewish rabbis had great psychological understanding and I still am into reading about that. Uh, this is the Rabbi Akiba, the rabbi that didn't go crazy, that was integrated after the process of that whole thing. It's actually a memory portrait of Rabbi Bellino. I don't know if it looks like him, but it looks like him to me. Um, and again, it's the same synagogue in the background. So I wanted to kind of show, kind of like, kind of like a, a good guy, rational rabbi that can go both ways and be okay with it, you know? Uh, this is the Fifth Palace. It's called Witch or Self-Delusion. Those of you that have seen the 1939 Wizard of Oz, this is the climactic scene where the witch appears in the glass ball. Dorothy's calling out, Auntie M, Auntie M, and the witch comes, and she laughs hysterically at her, right? And it's this lie, like Dorothy was expecting her aunt, and she goes to, like, mess with Dorothy's head. So I thought that was a great image. If you look in the painting, some of this is from the photograph, some of this is made up. So this is from a, uh, a photo still, it's the ball actually, and Margaret Hamilton. 
The hand is made up, it's from the Flying Monkeys. The glass, the ruby slippers is from another still and it's partly made up, so Dorothy's in there too. Joel, so again, I just want to let you know you're over 12 minutes. Okay, so. okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. <laughs> if you can wrap up. As Betzalel, so he looks like a rabbi. Um, disintegration, uh, the six palaces, I have eyes, but I cannot see if this is going to get more fragmented. And the last one is actually a fragment of a larger new self-portrait, and that's me now. So, okay. Thank you so much. That was absolutely stupendous. Um, so now you should stop sharing your screen, or actually you can leave them up during questions and answers. Right. Um, I'm going to um, call on people who ask something in the chat, and then I'm going to open it to um, other questions. And what I'd like you to do, please, is to go into the participants field, and you can raise a hand there for, and ask questions for Joel. And I'll sure. call on you, and you can unmute yourself. So the first question is from Tina Marcus. Would you sure. unmute yourself, please? There we go. <laughs> yeah. So Joe, really exciting colors. I really. Uh, I'm getting right. some backlog there. Yeah, I'm don't not... unmute unless you're asking a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh no, you're good. Thank you, um, Joel. You, I love your colors. I just love how your paintings make me feel, um, and and uh, and the backstory, of course, really put it all together for me. But uh, I have no idea what what are the sizes of these uh, paintings. They're, they're modest, and again, because I, I was recovering from neck surgery, I had saw they're 18 by 24s, that's what I could manage. And I wanted to put them together in a big configuration. So it would be say 10 by uh, 10 by five or even bigger. And the thing is, the more paintings I do with this, the more people come to mind in Jewish history or Jewish text mythology. So. Right, and, and then just a follow-up question. So since you plan on um, putting these all together in, in another composition, when you're when you are making these individual paintings was there some thought behind of how you're going to piece them together so that that composition may flow through that space I, I think the same way i think it's going to be uh chronological and emotional like historically chronological and emotional i'll start with personal self-portraits and then go out from there and then personifications of mystical experiences taken from and i, I use movies i use comic books I use um, old illustrations. I use master painting, you know, National Geographic photos, you know, wh whatever I think worked. I'm a figurative painter. I'm not abstract. And so the idea of just doing an abstraction, it never, I, it never looks right to me, so. Oh, thank you so much. Enjoy yeah. it. Well, thank, thank you, you, Tina. Um, and we have a question, let's see, from Tati. Uh, I don't know if it's specifically for yeah, Joel, but it, go ahead. Yeah, it's for Joel. Yeah. First, I'm glad to see you so productive. It means you're recovering very well from your surgery, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Then did you do all those works recently? 2020, except for one painting. They're all done in 2020. Wow, you're so productive. Thank you. It's amazing. So you mentioned that you made the Michelangelo look like a rabbi. Yeah. Any particular reason? What's his, what's his yeah. Jewish? <laughs> and no, no, not, not at all. But the thing is that I like finding Judaic things in non-Jewish people. And Michelangelo also was a synthesizer of Jewish and Greek. The whole Sistine Chapel is a synthesis of Hebraic and Greek thought. You know, he has the prophets and he has the Sibyls together. And so that was very striking to me. There are aspects in in Christianity that sought to understand the Jewish tradition. And, and so he was one of those people. Thank you, Tati. Um, we have one... Very interesting oh, look, but you made like kind of a mosaic, look like mosaic. Very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very yeah. Okay. Great questions. Um, we've got one more question for Joel sure. from Elizabeth. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I, you had mentioned the palaces. What is that? I, I didn't understand the context there. Okay, so in the text, and Richard can probably uh, bring this up better later, but in the text of these, th the, the later, right, it starts in the sixth century or even earlier, and then it develops until modern rabbis in, in the Talmud, in the Jewish mystical writings, Kabbalah, all the way through, and they each add a different layer to it. 
So uh, one of the structures that they talk about are six palaces. And I'm sure it's very similar to other kinds of mysticism, whether Muslim or Hindu. And the palaces represent levels. And you have to get to different levels to go further in the mystical experience. And they represent different things. Now, when we read the, the, what they were, it was really hard to understand. I mean, it made no logical sense. It was about, like, I, I put up the, the version of the Babylonian Talmud. You could look at it. It was about water turning to stone. And, you know, so it was all these kind of, like, you have to be in on the note to understand what they're getting at or kind of figure out an allegorical meaning for yourself. So I, I took it in my own way. Thank you so much, Joel. And thank you, Elizabeth, for your question. And uh, now we're going to um, turn it over to Dorit for an introduction to Leah. Sure. And um, Joel, please stop your share. So that, do I, what do I hit? Uh, click share? on the bottom middle of your screen. There should be um, uh, maybe the share screen. You just click on that and stop share. Stop share. OK. Yeah, there you go. OK, okay great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dorit, you're up. Sure. Thank you very much, Joel, for a great uh, presentation and the opportunity to see the, the new uh, productions of you. You did so much, and I love the sense of humor in your work. Great Thank work. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, presenting uh, Lara, who was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and began her art studies at the University of New Hampshire. She received her BFA with honor of Bezalel Academy of Art in Jerusalem and completed her MFA at the New York Studio School. Having moved back and forth many, oh, I'm continuing uh, representing uh, Leah Raab. She's uh, having moved back and forth many times between cultures of Israel and the United States. She paints themes of dislocation and belonging. Deeply important familiar places or moment in time reflect internal tensions in the seemingly calm setting overlaid with a sense of impending dawn that may explode at any moment. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Leah's preoccupation is with depicting sense of outdoor prayers or of praying in isolation. Leah now lives and paints in Ranana, Israel. Go ahead, Leah, share your screen. Thank you to Yona and the Jewish Art Salon, to Dorit and Judith for this wonderful opportunity to show my work. Thank you for continuing to provide us with a vibrant art community. Okay. At the beginning of the pandemic, I was unable to focus, overwhelmed by the news. I felt frozen and scared. I spent a lot of time saying to Hillem and praying for friends and relatives who were sick. Unfortunately, some died and some are still recovering. During this time, I observed many people turning to prayer as a personal expression of hope, a wish for the future, a plea for healing, or a more formal and traditional way of communicating with God. Nice. I'm sorry? Prayer verbalizes our needs and desires or expresses gratitude. When one is feeling helpless, prayer can give a sense of purpose. I believe that there is a great power in the words of prayer bringing an energy into the universe. I daily witness people praying in solitude on balconies or backyards, standing alone outside of a shul, or even on a busy street corner at sunrise. Some people congregate in parks, playgrounds, or driveways, seeking the comfort and support of belonging to community. Coming together, yet distance, these figures appear angelic and righteous, wrapped in their talitot. I am very moved by the stillness and serenity of these poignant outdoor scenes. Whenever I come upon them, I am immediately struck by an aura of luminosity or pure holiness. When something deeply touches me, it creates a strong reaction within me, and I become obsessed with the need to record it. I started sketching and painting these moments in time, which I found so paradoxical, spiritually uplifting, yet at the same time, heartrending to see lost figures outside of the shul. For me, painting has also been a form of prayer or meditation. It is quiet and reflective. It forces me to slow down, organize, reevaluate my thoughts and deepen my perspective. Painting is my way of experiencing the world as I analyze and explore the many expressions of prayer during Corona. 
I'm absorbed with manipulating images within the space and making unusual color choices to create my own reality. In my work, unrecognizable masked figures gather, sometimes appearing as ghosts, juxtaposed with odd playground equipment. These comical structures seem out of place for a serious prayer service. Some scenes look bizarre, almost as if people are facing and worshiping the cartoon-like characters. Oftentimes, the comic book figures look more animated than the people themselves. Worshippers stand immobile, deep in prayer. A sense of melancholy and foreboding is intensified by the harsh forces of nature. There is a vulnerability in the lone figures standing outside sporting t-shirts, shorts, and flip-flops, rather than wearing more typical synagogue attire. I'm in awe of their devotion and resolve to show up daily. It wasn't easy to be outdoors in the blazing heat of the summer, seeking out a shaded, quiet, and safe place in which to pray. Women praying at bus stops is a common sight. Observing these tender moments feels intrusive, but maintaining a respectful distance makes it very challenging to capture the more powerful moments. I use my own photographs as references combined with memory or imagination. Some paintings are even self-portraits on the outside looking in. As a spectator, reluctant to participate. In truth, I pray best alone. The figure on the right, can you see the figure on the right or is it covered by the? We see that. We see it. Okay, the figure on the right is a family member saying Kaddish during the week of Shiva for my mother-in-law. The funeral and Shiva were unusual and strange because of the restrictions. During this year of mourning, it is difficult to find a safe minion where the family can say Kaddish comfortably. Again, I'm hesitant to invade their privacy during prayer. This is a friend of mine, a woman saying Kaddish in an all-male minion. She gladly gave me permission to approach and even to participate. Prayer can be calming and comforting during the uncertainty and confusion we now live with. It can be strengthening or even celebratory when we sing, especially in unison. On Pesach, it was uplifting to sing Manishtana on our porches, apart from, yet together, with our neighbors in Ranana, when we couldn't be with our children. I experienced many stirring moments in Rosh Hashanah when our shul was closed. People gathered outdoors in the courtyard for Tikiat Shofar. The sounds of the shofar represented yet another level of prayer, the raw emotion of crying, on Sukkot, we were reminded of our vulnerability by eating outside in the sukkah, as well as praying outside, forbidden to enter the shuls. This is a street scene of Hakafot during the Hoshana prayer. On Shemini Atzeret, we recited Geshem, the prayer for rain, asking for life, good health, and sustenance. These are all things that are so uncertain, unpredictable, and relevant today. This is in front of our shul. I continue to delve deeper into more intimate moments of prayer as people express their innermost thoughts during these unsettling times. I participated in many Zoom ceremonies during COVID. This is a family Zoom Brit. I'm watching from the top right square. Part of the atonement process on Yom Kippur is saying al Khait, reviewing past mistakes. During these months of introspection, I put together three videos of my recent work with accompanying music, prayers, and songs in Hebrew. Um, the three videos are on my website where you can also view earlier work of mine. And six of my paintings from this series are now on exhibit at the Leonardo Gallery on Leonardo da Vinci Street in Tel Aviv. Thank you all for looking at my work and may we all stay safe and healthy.
Leia, that was unbelievably moving chronicle of this time. And I dare say a very unique one. I, I can't imagine that anybody anywhere in the world has recorded this time and reacted to it, that little slice of life the way you have. So that alone is quite an achievement, but they're, they're so beautiful. Um, and thank you for sharing them. And uh, most of the comments are <laughs> just kind of lauding you, but we do have one hand raised by Richard McBee. So Richard, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thanks, Leah. Shalom nice. Aleichem. Nice to see you. Uh, wow, uh, really a wonderful, wonderful um, suite of work. Um, I think what strikes me, well, two things. One, um, many, many of your work, you have a sensitivity to light. I know you're concentrating on other things, but light, of course, gives the atmosphere and it is just, it's captivating. Um, uh, I think also what struck me is, um, you put us all in a very a different world from my perspective, okay? I spent all the time you were in Israel working on those, I spent in the country with no one around. Your vision of this crisis is, is deeply social, is deeply about being with other people and not just other people, but other people who are observant Jews, who are reaching out, who are, who are in prayer. Now, of course, these, all these people go about their lives, but still you presented a world that in an amazing way, and I'm sh almost ashamed to say this, but it is because of where you live, that is kind of foreign to me. You know, I mean, you're in a, you're in a world, I'm certainly, I'm assuming you're in Renana, right? Yes. Renana is, is probably predominantly observant. No. No, no it's really. a big mix of everybody. Right. Well, but it certainly feels very much like you're in an observant world. And it's, and it's, it's both, it's perplexing, it's inspiring. Uh, it's really an astounding view into um, something different and, you know, makes me want to live, move to Israel. <laughs> anyway, that was not a question. <laughs> I don't, it's not a religious city. And, yeah. and it's, I don't see these scenes everywhere. I go on these morning walks because I have to walk every day. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm struck by it because in the middle of nowhere, I suddenly see people davening. It's, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre in a playground, in a park, in a driveway. You don't see it everywhere. But when you go on a morning walk, you, you come across these scenes. But of course, in Sheffield, Massachusetts, and in New York City, you pretty much see it nowhere. You or at least in Manhattan. It? You don't see it in Manhattan? No, 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 not at all. No. And it reminds me of a flock of birds, you know, when you just I walk around. I don't agree with you. I live in Manhattan and I see it. Uh -huh. and we I have a few more Chicago. questions. Oh, sorry, Tati. Okay. Um, uh, Susan Maytel has her hand up. Go ahead, Susan, unmute yourself, please. I was, yes, I, I, they, they're really so beautiful, so moving, and really brought tears. Um, mm -hmm. What size are they? I have, I, I should have written it. Um, some of them are 30 by 40 large canvases, wow. but because, because of the pandemic and the restrictions, I couldn't get to the art supply store. So I actually started working small, um, small canvases. Some are eight by 10, nine by 12, uh, 20 by 28, um, 30 by 40. There's a big one that's uh, 38 by 48 but 28 by 20, most of them are small because I was limited with my space and I was limited with going shopping for art supplies. Thank you, Susan. Um, Hedy Abramowitz, would you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? Yeah, hi, Leah. Hi. Congratulations on a great presentation and really amazing artwork. When they're seen all together, it's very powerful. Um, I also live in Israel, so uh, I also lived in a mixed neighborhood, and I also regularly saw people davening outside in front of shuls, outside of, uh, in parks, uh, even uh, sitting on chairs in the back of the proper courtyard of a shul. Um, there would be women who would have chairs lined up and so forth. Uh, but, and it's, it's really not unusual in Israel to see these things, especially during the lockdown. Um, 
And there were two lockdowns. We just finished the second one. So I just want to say that uh, I attribute this, I mean, this is the Jewish Art Salon, I think I can say this. Uh, I attribute this to uh, living in Israel is very a very different experience, as Richard McBee just pointed out. Uh, it's not an uncommon sight, what, what Leah saw. What is uncommon is how she saw it. And I think her recording it and her uh, need to record it is um, a big factor of this suite of work. And also the ironies that she found in the playground scenes and, um, and the uh, incorporating the very mundane but very real aspects of the bizarreness of people play, uh, praying outside where children play outside. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. What's my question? I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, I, Hetty. Um, I just want to make sure that we have time for Philip. So I'm going to hand it over go to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, no, you did great. And um, uh, I did notice, Joel, that you raised your hand. And if you could hold your question until the end, that would be great. And I'll circle back to you. So Dorit. Great. First of all, uh, Leah, you, you, body of work is just fascinating. I'm a fan, you know that. Uh, but I think this, this body of work is like a documentation, the paintings. Usually you see this in, in photography, but, but this is like, I never saw a documentation in paintings, uh, like, like frames. It was like a movie, it was fascinating. I think also you brought the, the, the point of view of Orthodox society and which we don't see and, and feminism. There was there a lot of uh, female praying in public areas and this voice we're missing so much. And thank you for that. I really uh, like this work. Thank you, um, appreciating, thank you. Thank you. Uh, going to Philip Schwartz. Philip is from Metro New York and attended the School of Museum of Fine Art in Boston, where he was awarded a traveling scholarship and an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Art as a winner of their prestigious fifth year competition. Philip has shown at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston and at galleries throughout Boston, Provincetown, and New York. He currently live, lives in New York's Hudson Valley, where he continues to produce and exhibit his work. Philip has participated in group exhibitions and promote social justice and HIV awareness in the local, national, and international arenas. Philip's works throughout his career has spoken to the relationship between human suffering and the divine. Much of his work is inspired by his family's relationship in the Holocaust and his own inner journey in coming to terms with that history. Some of his work might be seen as questioning where God is in our struggle, while other pieces are visual laments or meditations. His paintings reference Orthodox Christian iconography and is made using authentic materials, egg tempera and gilding on gesso prime boards. His paper cutouts and aluminum prints engage a more contemporary feel. Philip, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Dori. Thanks, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm starting here because um, this is where I was when really the pandemic became clear to me, where uh, it really became obvious that things had changed and weren't going back anytime soon. We were, uh, my husband and I were at the opening for Dorit's I Am an Immigrant show. And um, it was a wonderful occasion, but it was just very obvious that things had changed. There was no hugging or kissing or um, anything. There was still no social distancing, but we were uh, definitely uncomfortable. 
And during the visit to Berlin, uh, I went to the, um, the new synagogue, which is partially rebuilt. They did not rebuild the, uh, the sanctuary, but they have some galleries in there and um, they had a really nice show and it sort of inspired me um, to think about a body of work, uh, which I'll get to later. When I got home, everything was different. Um, we couldn't find any groceries or masks or anything. Uh, I learned to sew. I, I ordered a sewing machine online, uh, which took a while. And um, I took some YouTube uh, tutorials. I learned to sew masks and I, I decided to learn to make caps too so I could look a little dapper through the pandemic. Um, I made some combination sets of masks and caps And this was um, one of the cutouts that I, I made when I got home. And it's a, uh, based on a photograph of a young rabbi. Uh, the, it's a studio portrait that was taken, uh, the photograph is a studio portrait that was taken in the very late 30s. And um, it's the kind of thing oops, that I was envisioning, um, you know, for a show at the, um, you know, in a synagogue setting, in the gallery at a, a synagogue kind of a setting. And this woman is Vladka Mead. And this is the only piece I'm showing um, today that I did before uh, the shutdown. And when my sister-in-law saw this cutout that I did, she Googled her and sent, and got her book. She, it turns out, wrote a memoir um, called On Both Sides of the Wall. I knew she had been very active in the resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, but her, her memoir is incredible. She was just an incredible heroine. She provided um, arms to the Warsaw Ghetto. This, this cutout is based on the photograph she used for her false documents to pass as an Aryan. And she was very active um, all over Poland during the war, supplying money and goods to Jews who couldn't pass as Aryan. And she also was the person who supplied the recipe for Molotov cocktails to the resistance fighters within the ghetto. So I just admire her so tremendously. And um, she didn't die until uh, the 2000s at some point. Um, so she lived a very long, fruitful life. And this is based on a studio portrait of a little boy. And um, this is sort of another, another cutout that I see as being part of a, a show. I would love to do a show that's sort of a site specific to a, a city and do paper cutouts based on, on Jews of that city. This is a less fortunate little boy. Um, it's his mug shot. There are absolutely just hundreds of these on the Holocaust Memorial Museum website. Um, it's from Warsaw also. Um, Warsaw is distinctive in that the, the Warsaw ghetto was incredibly well documented. Um, just there are many photographs. This is another photograph, based, a cutout based on an, another photograph from the Warsaw Ghetto, an elderly woman begging. Um, I think that uh, there are just so many poignant photographs from there. It's, it's incredibly moving. This little boy fascinated me because there are probably a dozen photographs of him in these sleeping poses. And I, I say they're poses because um, it's clear to me that he was told to pose in these different positions and in different locations around the ghetto. And in some of them, you can see in some of the photographs of him, you can see a hat behind him. And what that tells me is that the photographer was German because um, Jews were forced to remove their hats when they were in the presence of an Aryan.
And this cutout is based on a, a photograph, um, a very early photograph from the Holocaust. It's, the photograph was taken in 1939. And you can see that um, these prisoners have already been starved. It's, uh, it was, the photograph was smuggled out um, early, you know, as a warning, which clearly was unheeded. Um, or didn't reach the right people, but the photograph survives in the, the archives of the Holocaust Memorial Museum. This cutout is based on the photograph of a Jewish partisan fighter. It was taken um, at the end of the war. He just really um, struck me, his um, just the power of him and his nobility. So this was the first uh, painting I did during the lockdown. And I work in egg tempera paint. Um, this was a self-portrait from my studio. As you can see, I'm wearing one of my cap and mask combos. And I think it sort of speaks to the isolation that I was feeling being, you know, living in the lockdown. So my sewing skills improved and I, I made this vest and cap set. Um, I, I did it really as a gardening vest, but when I finished it, it felt very sort of paramilitary. And I sort of took on this character um, and I felt like, you know, I wanted to pose as, um, as a character of a partisan hiding out and you know, waiting for my next move or the next orders. And um, so this is more of a, it's almost like a, it's a self-portrait, but it's a portrait of someone else. And in this self-portrait, I'm sewing a star onto a garment. And I was really sort of thinking about what it would be like, you know, what, what was it like in 1938 when the Nuremberg laws were passed, when suddenly you had to sew stars onto all your clothing and identify yourself. I mean, not that I hide being a Jew or, or could, but, um, you know, to suddenly have to, to sew this, you know, Judenstern onto your clothing. And um, it was a very powerful thing to do, really. And I made a replica of the star following the instructions in the Nuremberg laws about the scale of it and the, you know, the color and the size text and everything. Um, and then I sewed it on and it was a very strange feeling to do that. And you can see my dog watching me as, uh, as I do it. And here I am actually wearing the star. This, this piece is called um, Self-Portrait with Kazakh Carpet. And it's amazing to me how large the star felt once I actually put the garment on. The, uh, it didn't seem that big until I put it on. Um, and I used a Kazakh carpet as the background because um, I know of a bunch of people, the mother of a friend included, who sheltered through the war in Kazakhstan and were, um, were you know, uh, safe there. And the people of Kazakhstan were quite hospitable to them through the war. And this piece is called Self-Portrait on the Wrong Side of a Fence. And in it, I actually, I use a bit of um, Christian symbolism. I, my father was an art historian and I've always been extremely interested in Christian iconography. Uh, the, the Christian symbolism I'm using here is the color of the cap. The, um, the color red is symbolic of martyrdom in Christian iconography. And uh, I thought it sort of exemplified the um, sort of the concentration camp experience in a sense. What I've done here is I've taken a photograph of myself behind a fence and then I replaced the background with a picture of the current state of a portion of Sachsenhausen. And um, you can see it's just completely unkempt. It's being allowed to go back to nature. This is, um, you know, a portion that's not open to the public and it's just being overgrown with trees and tall grasses. The buildings you see are barracks. Um, 
where I'm standing would be, you know, where you would assemble for roll call. And this last slide is called, um, the painting is called Self-Portrait Among the Lost. And I do a lot of research on the Holocaust Memorial Museum website, and you cannot avoid just hundreds of pictures of piles of corpses. And they're just heartbreaking. And every time I see one, I just, I feel um, like I want to somehow be with these people, like to um, support them in some way. And I, it's, I mean, obviously you can't be with them. But in this painting, I've put myself with sort of my lost brothers, if you will. Um, and just try to be there for them or in support of them, at least, you know, in this way. Um, I did add a little bit of clothing, um, just in the interest of modesty, just the, uh, the, the pants on the one figure, everyone else was covered to a degree. Um, and I, the way I positioned my figure blocks another figure. So, but I just felt the, there should be some dignity accorded. Uh, uh, so anyway, that is um, my presentation. Thank you, Philip. Uh, such powerful, moving work. Um, so exquisitely mm -hmm. executed and emotionally profound, spiritually profound. We have a lot of uh, questions and comments for you in the chat. And I'm going to sort of condense three of the questions because three people, Rena, Marlene, and Ross, essentially asked the same question, which was about the technique involved in your paper cutting. Um, they wanted to know more about it. I think Marlene said um, it looks like a silk screen. And Ross asked, I think it was Ross, asked, why did you choose paper cut? So can you tell us a little bit about how you work with paper cut for these pieces? Well, I, um, you know, it's funny, a lot of people think they look like silk screens. And um, I've been asked about that before. And I, I like to work with paper. Um, I, I just, I choose an image and I, I draw the image onto, um, onto a piece of paper. And then I choose colors and I cut each color out and I assemble it sort of as you would assemble a collage. Um, for me, it's somehow it's more comfortable I, than, um, than silk screen. I, I have a small studio and I'm not really comfortable with fumes. Um, that's one of the reasons I paint in egg tempera because there's, it's just water and egg yolk and there's no, um, you know, the worst fume you'll get is vinegar. Um, and with silk screening, it's, it's very hard to not have fumes. And what I've done, like where I, when I have printed these larger on aluminum, I actually send them out to have that done. Um, I'm just not a, a I, I don't do well with toxic fumes. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it does. And I also paint in egg tempera, so we need to talk. And I yeah. also got into it because of, partly because of that and also love of, of icons. Kimetta I, um, asked a question about your, do you make your own paint? And I think they, it, clearly the answer is yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, and then I see that uh, Richard has his hand up. And then Joel, I didn't forget you had a question for Leah, so we'll circle back. But uh, Richard, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Wow. Philip, thank you so much. Uh, an, an astounding uh, amount of work here. Uh, the, it's, it's so interesting that the, the cutouts, uh, and I know you've kind of written about them, actually, I think one, one where somewhere along the line, you actually talked about how it was, you felt that it was a kind of a relaxing meditative experience. Well, yeah, but not for the viewer. For the viewer, there, it, it creates this, this unexpected tension on the surface. Uh, especially when you really see that it's a cutout. Some of them are field masked, but many of them not. So it's like a whole other experience of how the uh, image is translate, translated. 
Uh, but the thing I really want to focus on is um, uh, it seems to me that you have used in a way this covered experience, the experience of what we are all going through as a Holocaust metaphor, which I certainly never would have thought of. So mm -hmm. tell me if that's in fact really intentional. And secondly, the, the other thing that's kind of obvious, but it's really quite brilliant is essentially the self-portrait as social commentary. So maybe address those two things, would you? Yeah, um, well, I think that, you know, the lockdown, um, it almost felt like going into hiding to me. And, and I think that evoked a lot of um, feelings that made me think about the Holocaust even more than I usually do. And I think about the Holocaust a lot. <laughs> Um, so, so yes, um, it did bring that up for me a lot. Uh, and so that, that is intentional. Um, I don't know that it started as intentional, but I certainly took the ball and ran with it. Um, and I think the, the, the self-portrait, um, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable using self-portrait uh, for several reasons. One um, is that I'm okay with making myself look, you know, look bad, let's say. Um, I don't care if I'm ugly in a portrait, whereas like I get very um, nervous when I paint other people that they won't be pleased with the way they look at the end of it. And I tend to paint overly flattering portraits of people. And um, I don't do that when I paint myself. Um, so it's, I, I feel like I'm my, not to, not to flatter myself, but I'm my best model because I'm most comfortable painting myself. Um, and it's, I get very nervous painting other people. Let me just mention that the, um, I mean, uh Many of them are really powerful, but the two, especially where you're sewing on the Star of David, uh, and then the second one in front of the, uh, the carpet, but sewing on this, uh, the Star of David is, you, you've, you've pulled together things that are so unexpected. You've got this um, very, very little pretty uh, sewing kit, right? So it's so domesticated, it is so normal as it were. And then you've got your glasses and I guess that must be a, a threader there, right? And the dog and then, and the tile, the tile behind it, this kind of uh, Dutch fan style, whatever it is, it is so much about domesticity of, of a security, uh, a safe place. And then you suddenly turn it on me with the with, with the the mug and David, and you right. looking back. Look what I am forced to do. I, I'm I'm giving I'm getting chills just thinking about what you've done in that one painting. Uh, anyway, oh thank congratulations, you. Congratulations, Yishakov. Wow. I'm going to jump in because we uh, we ran right. over again, but and there are a few more people with questions, and Joel, we didn't get to you either. But uh, uh, Shara, I want to give you a chance because we haven't heard your voice yet. So if you have a quick question for Philip. Please unmute. Uh, I'm a child of two Holocaust survivors and I, I rarely am able to look. Thank you for your work. Oh, thank my, you. Yeah, my question to you is, when you do your cuts, are you using knife, scissors or both? Both, both, mostly knife. But for larger um, areas, I'll, I will use a scissors. Stunning, especially the, the limited palette is just perfect. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashera. And um, Joel, I promised you I would circle back. So here I am, if you have a quick question for Leia, and then I think we should wrap it up. Okay, um, I guess I'm gonna, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass on Leia. I can talk to Leia privately. Leia, congratulations. I want to ask Philip actually, because now it's kind of um, uh, closer in time. Uh, Philip, do you know the work of uh, Felix Nussbaum, the Holocaust artist? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and actually, when we were in Berlin, I saw some um, work of his at the um, Museum of um, German History and Culture that I hadn't seen before. 
Uh, they had his um, self-portrait, his last self-portrait at the Neue Museum for one of their shows. And it's just, uh, it seems there's a, a thematic connection. And I guess it's a kind of about, you know, artist as hunted victim, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah. uh, I, I just want, you, you're an extraordinary artist, really. Thank you so much. Oh, but, thank you, Joel. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to apologize to anyone I didn't call on. And um, please reach out individually to the artists uh, if you don't have their contact info you can probably find it on the jewish art salon website and i just want to say thank you to the artists it was another fantastic program and um dorit i think you had a few reminders for us well, first of all thank you philip this was an amazing uh, beautiful uh, presentation and your approach to the holocaust in your paper cuts are just fascinating thank you again mm -hmm. love your work so thank you everybody for being with us tonight. And it was amazing again. I really enjoyed to see all the presentations. Um, I wanna remind everybody about the program for next month. We have a little uh, time in between right now. So November 17, we're gonna have uh, presenting uh, Julian Volach and Siona Benjamin. Don't miss that. I uh, hope to see you stay safe. Great to see you and thank you Jewish Art Salon for the stage and goodbye for now.